recording. Okay, so hello, um, I'm Catherine Solomon, um, and I'm going to be the e-moderator e for, for the webinar today. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our, our speaker, Sarah, who will be introducing the Foundation's new guidance and strategies uh, for the classroom, which will replace our existing classroom um, strategies for primary and secondary. Sarah has played a massive role in rewriting these strategies, along with our colleague, Caroline Bruce, um, and we're so pleased to be able to launch them today. And I'm really pleased to have Sarah here today to tell you a little bit more about the work and how we've organized the strategies. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about Sarah, uh, Sarah joined the foundation um, as a trainer in 2021. Uh, she has over 30 years experience in a range of different settings, including language schools, secondary schools, um, local education authorities and a UK university. She's been a mainstream English and drama teacher. Uh, Sarah has an MA in applied linguistics and an ESOL focused PGCE. She also has two additional postgraduate diplomas. Um, so you're in very safe hands today. Um, yeah. So without further ado, I will pass over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Catherine. Hello, everyone. It's really nice to see um, to see the results of the roll poll, it looks like we've got um, everybody. Uh, biggest group is EL coordinators, which is uh, not surprising, I guess, but we have senior leaders, primary and secondary teachers and TA. So to all of you, welcome. And I hope that all of you find something useful um, in today's webinar. So the aim of the webinar today is to introduce the new guidance and strategies contents and to begin to familiarise you with them. Um, they were launched today and I hope that um, many of you are probably already looking at them. So let's get started. In this session, I'm, I've sort of hung it around five rather basic classroom type questions of why, what, who, how and when. And... I'm going to go through those one at a time, illustrating the answers with examples from the document itself. And then there'll be an opportunity at the end for you to ask questions. And Catherine and I will both answer them. So let's start with the why. Why update the guidance? I thought I'd start with a very apposite quote from Evans et al, which encapsulates maybe why there's a need for this document at all. Um, the aim is obviously to help teachers to help you guys to make your lessons more inclusive for EAL learners. And that, of course, benefits both the learners, um, the teachers and the schools. So why replace the originals? The old strategies documents, um, the primary version was actually the second most downloaded thing from our website last year. So clearly very popular. However, we did also receive feedback uh, that many of the links on that resource were no longer working. They were just old or broken or yeah, for whatever reason, no longer effective. Also, we felt that it was somewhat repetitive and hard to navigate in places. Although the content, um, the content was very good, there was nothing wrong with that at all. It was just not our finest work in terms of, of style, we felt. And I guess everything needs updating from time to time, just because, you know, time moves on and things happen. And in this case, COVID, COVID had happened, which had a profound effect, of course, on education with partial school closures and lockdowns during the pandemic, meaning that many learners um, using EAL were denied the experience of hearing and speaking English in social situations. And indeed, research by the Bell Foundation found that school aged children using EAL suffered from language loss in English, particularly in the more productive skills of writing and speaking. Well, meanwhile, the level of curriculum content engaged with by learners, all learners, not just EAL, varies enormously according to factors such as access to technology and quiet study spaces, etc. As well as that, there'd be new populations of refugees and asylum seekers, notably from Ukraine and from Afghanistan, but others as well. And also, very importantly, the Bell Foundation had published its key principles um, and it seemed crazy that those were not aligned to the strategies document or the strategies document wasn't aligned to them. Um, and of course, as always, there'd be new research. So it was felt all in all that the strategies needed an update to reflect all of that. 
And you will find that much of the original guidance has been retained, but it's just been reorganized and streamlined to make it more user friendly. So what then, what is the final product? What have we produced? After a lot of research, a lot of head scratching, a lot of discussion, a lot of quietly going mad in front of computers, this is what we've got. It's a document full of guidance, ideas and suggestions for strategies which will help to include learners using EAL within the mainstream class. It is aimed primarily at including um, EAL learners in the mainstream, whatever their proficiency level. And so we have documents which are downloadable and printable, and we have documents which include links to relevant research and resources. So the main differences that you'll find from the original documents are these. Much of the original guidance has been retained, as I said, but it's been reorganized and it's now much more user-friendly, uh, we think. There are useful and working links to resources and to research, both from us at the Bell Foundation and from elsewhere. And there's also a glossary of key terms and hyperlinks to that throughout the document. The Bell Foundation's five key principles for EAL teaching are used as a frame to organise the guidance and strategies. And I will explain uh, quite a lot more about this later in the presentation. And then finally, of course, uh, new research that's happened more recently has been taken account of and sort of woven in to the strategies. So that's what you're going to find that's different. As part of our research, we also used focus groups made up of primary and secondary practitioners and asked for their comments on some of the early drafts and ideas um, for the strategies. And if anyone who contributed to um, either of those groups, the primary or the secondary, is watching then many, many thanks again because your opinions were invaluable. Um, the feedback from the focus groups, there, there was lots of it, but the key thing that I took was that they valued highly practical strategies. Um, they valued uh, ideas and real classroom examples, grounded in research and theory, yes, but concrete and actionable. So that's what we have endeavoured to provide. So who's the material for? Who will use it? Well, it's primarily intended for classroom and subject teachers, so I was glad to see lots of you here. Um, who have or expect to have learners using English as an additional language uh, in their classes. But the ideas and suggestions will also be very much of interest to EAL coordinators who work with those teachers alongside them, or those in other roles which seek to advise teachers on how best to include learners with EAL, whether that's um, in an LA capacity or as part of a, a MAT role. It'll also be of interest to support staff, such as teaching assistants, who are working in classes where there are learners who use EAL or who are working specifically with learners who are using EAL. And then finally, also for those who run interventions and withdrawal groups, these strategies can also be useful. Um, but they'll be useful alongside the curriculum that's being covered in, in the mainstream. And I'm hoping that we'll produce a further guidance document on how to apply this guidance to intervention classes. And um, that's planned, I believe, for next year. So let's have a look at how it's organized. So the guidance is separated into primary and secondary phases and includes age appropriate examples from all key stages. The guidance for each phase is available as a separate downloadable document, as those of you who've looked at it have probably already found. Um, but I would say, though, don't be afraid to step out of your key stage. If you're in key stage three, for example, you might well find ideas in the primary strategies that are useful and you know, vice versa. That goes the other way around as well. The guidance is organised um, according to assessment bands, A to E, following the EAL assessment framework for schools. I'm assuming most of you watching will know what these are, but um, if anybody doesn't, it's um, an assessment framework for EAL learners and it's freely available on the Bell Foundation website. And it, um, it assesses learners um, in five bands, A, B, C, D, E, going from new to English up to fluent. 
So learners don't always fit neatly into one band because they don't, and neither do activities and strategies. So therefore, you'll find it useful to read the in suggestions for the bands below and above the bands at which your learner's currently working. Additionally, some of the suggestions are relevant for more than one band, but as we've tried to avoid too much repetition, again, I would you know, very much recommend that you refer to the previous band. In many classes, of course, you'll have learners at different proficiency bands all in the one class. So in this case, it's a question of reading around the different strategies and deciding what would work for your context. We're also planning to update the tracker which accompanies the Bell Foundation assessment framework so that it'll be linked to the new strategies and suggestions and the guidance from these strategies will appear when it's populated. And we're hoping that this will be operational next year. The guidance document is also handily color coded to correspond to the proficiency bands. So you can see here at a glance that the screenshot here is about band D um, because it's orange. So the guidance and strategies are divided into those which are seen to be more useful for reading and viewing and writing, um, sometimes called literacy and also those for speaking and listening, i.e. oracy. We've used icons to represent these, as you can see, for quick navigation. Inevitably, of course, I mean, I think you know this, but inevitably there's overlap between all of these. So for example, a good reading, um, reading, viewing, writing activity always, I think always involves some element of teacher explanation or class or group prediction, planning, discussion, and that's of course involves oracy work. Oracy in its turn often happens in response to a written stimulus or in preparation for doing a piece of writing. So therefore, again, you'll certainly find it beneficial to read both sections, but we have strategies which lend themselves more to reading, viewing and writing activities and strategies which lean more towards the speaking and listening. We organize the guidance and strategies to align with the Bell Foundation's five key principles in order to make our offer to schools coherent with our um, fundamental core values. So you'll find strategies, for example, which will help reinforce our first key principle, which is that multilingualism is an asset. There's plenty of research um, around the crucial role that a learner's home language plays in their sense of identity and well-being as well as their, as developing greater cognitive flexibility and therefore ultimately uh, stronger academic performance. The guidance and suggestions then in this section are included to help you promote multilingualism and develop your thriving and your thriving dynamic world classroom. You can find out as well about ways to keep learners at all stages, way to keep the expectations high for learners at all stages of English language acquisition um, at the same time as providing the support they need to develop their English and learn the subject content. So in this section, you can find guidance and suggestions to help you avoid the temptation to dumb down or simplify the curriculum for EAL learners and instead to amplify it through judicious use of scaffolding activities. It's vital to bear in mind that the cognitive and academic abilities of learning users EAL are separate from their current ability to use English. And so therefore, like all learners, those using EAL will benefit from being motivated and challenged in the classroom, but with the support to make tasks achievable for them. So you can also find strategies um, which align with our third key principle, an integrated focus on language and content. So, the guidance and suggestions in this section can be used as you plan and teach your lessons to help you integrate your subject content with the English language learning and enable learners to achieve the double goal um, that they're faced with, that of acquiring English and progressing in their English language proficiency alongside acquiring and progressing in um, subject knowledge. You can find strategies as well that will help you to do effective and holistic assessments. Um, in order for 
assessments to be effective, they need to be relevant to the learner. And of course, many formal and standardized tests are designed to assess, for example, reading age or, or verbal reasoning or reading comprehension in English, nothing wrong with them, but they are designed for pupils for whom English is their first language. And as such, they're, they're of limited use really for learners using EAL as they won't on their own give you an accurate picture of the progress of that learner. So the guidance and suggestions in this section give you some ideas of how to supplement or adapt the assessment process um, in order to gain a fuller picture of the learners using EAL in your class. And then last but not least, very, very important, our fifth uh, key principle, strategies which will facilitate social inclusion. So learners using EAL, including new arrivals and those at the earlier stages of English language acquisition and late arrivals in key stage four, they need to be able to look around them in the school and feel that, yes, OK, this is somewhere where I can learn, where I can thrive, where I can be myself. They need to feel safe and secure and have a sense of belonging to their school and through that to the wider wider community um, in order to maximise their opportunities. This is, of course, especially important for children seeking asylum. And so in this section, you can find suggestions which will help you to facilitate this. So the principles are revisited. Um, through the proficiency band to reflect the learner's progression. So here, for example, you can see a screenshot from band A primary with suggestions for activities for a band A learner to reinforce the key principle that multilingualism is an asset. And at band A, it's suggesting some first language mentoring, perhaps first language buddies, because what the child has brought with them at that stage is their home language that's what they that's the only learning resource they have at that stage so fast forward to band d and you have the same principle in action at band d also primary by this time the learner's progressed and is now at a sort of intermediate level of english a competent level as well as their home language knowledge and they can now be asked to reflect on that and talk about the differences and similarities of english and other languages they know and through doing that deepen their cognitive ability and their linguistic ability. So as well as suggestions of activities to use with your learners using EL in class, um, such as this one, which is about planning for language structures needed in a task, there are also examples provided of what that might look like in practice. And these can be found in grid form, looking like that, at the end of each section. Um, Please note that these are not intended to be lesson plans. They're not lesson plans. They're snapshots of how a fictional learner working at a certain key stage and a certain proficiency in English bands might be included um, in a particular lesson. There are examples from two key stages at the end of every section. And they're set out in table form with what the teacher is doing, what the class is doing and what the learner is doing. And we've tried to include a range of different topics and different curriculum subject areas. And this again is in response to the um, to the focus groups idea for practical examples and hope that you find them useful. Here you can see an example of this. For, um, this one is secondary key stage three band A learner in a geography lesson with a class that's studying rivers. You can see that the band A learner is included via some Fairly simple adaptations, actually. There's some flipped learning of vocabulary, some video subtitles in her home language, and some careful grouping for classwork. So with some very simple strategies, the band a learner is included here in a key stage three lesson. There's also... Oh, I think I've done that. There's also a handy glossary of key terms with hyperlinks to take you there throughout the document. Okay, so finally, when and where do we envisage this being most useful? Of course, we won't know this for sure until we start getting feedback from you on how it's being used. But the following slides show our ideas and, and certainly some possibilities.
it will be useful alongside the Bell Foundation Assessment Framework to design suitable classroom activities um, for learners using EAL, depending on their proficiency level. There are some examples of what this might look like coming up, I'm about to, to show them. But basically, when you ascertain a proficiency in English band for your learner, you can consult the document for advice on suitable strategies or activities to help that learner progress both their English language levels and their curriculum knowledge. The guidance and suggestions also offer some teaching ideas and examples which you can adapt to suit your context. Um, links are included to resources, which will provide further detail. Um, some of them are from the Bell Foundation Great Ideas, for example, which is a series of approaches and strategies that are recommended for learners using EAL by us. Some of them are to concrete classroom resources for particular <laughs> subject areas, but you will find teaching ideas. And the guidance includes suggestions which will help you with organization of your classroom through things like seating and grouping or deploying support staff if you're lucky enough to have them and ways of encouraging and promoting the use of languages by grouping learners in particular ways, um, ways of promoting social inclusion, ways of making academic content accessible while maintaining your high expectations all through your organization and your use of support staff. And also, we hope that this guidance and these strategies, when you become familiar with them, will provide you with uh, an EAL friendly lens, um, which you can look through to help you when you're considering creating or indeed buying in curriculum resources for classroom use. For example, you'll be able to think whether the key principles are adhered to. Will this resource, um, will this resource give me space for valuing languages other than English? Um, will this resource enable me to integrate language with subject content? And if so, how? What are the opportunities for assessment here, etc.? <clears throat> and then also it'll be useful. This resource will be useful for most teachers at some point in their careers, because most teachers will teach multilingual learners at some point in their careers. Findings from the OECD TALIS survey found that in fact, teaching in multilingual and multicultural settings is one of the top three areas um, where teachers ask for help. With 22% of primary school teachers and 22% also of secondary teachers that felt not at all prepared for teaching in a multicultural, multilingual setting following their initial teacher education. So we're hopeful that it will at some point be useful for almost all teachers. Okay, to finish up, I'm going to illustrate how all of this, using the strategies and guidance document, might play out in the real world. So I've put together a couple of illustrative case studies, uh, which refer back again to the focus group's recommendations to provide practical and actionable examples. These case studies are based on amalgamation, shall we say, of, of real children who I've known, um, but they're not, in fact, real children. OK, so first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Sadia. Sadia is um, an Urdu speaker and she arrived from Pakistan in the final months of reception year, just before school was about to close for the summer. <coughs> she's already made a couple of friends, but she's a very shy girl. And she's now started in year one um, at Bande, a very little English at the moment. But she's a happy, lively girl, full of curiosity, she likes books and she likes animals and she's in luck because this term, year one, is kicking off with the topic of mini beasts. So the teacher, Sadia's teacher, has a look at the guidance for band day learners and finds these suggestions. Planning to make sure the learner has a grip on key vocabulary and structure to participate in the lesson. The importance of nurturing opportunities to speak in non-threatening situations and the importance of being able to use the home language. And then very important always, but particularly at Bande and particularly for younger learners, uh, the importance of visuals. So the teacher starts the mini beast topics by showing pictures and naming mini beasts. She keeps expectations high by encouraging Sadia to join in the oral naming activity. There's no reason she can't do that. 
So Saadia listens and repeats words for mini beasts. This is good vocabulary building for the whole class, as some will know the names of all the creatures and all their body parts. Others, both EAL and not EAL, will not. So she's practicing structures like this is a butterfly, it has got wings, and she's showing pictures and naming mini beasts. And that's the beginning. Then the teacher puts the class into pairs or threes, and each pair or three is given a picture. Sadia is grouped with Helen, who's a friendly girl, a confident girl, who's a good model of English. And together, Sadia and Helen move around the classroom with their picture, showing their picture to other pairs and describing it. So Helen says, this is a ladybird, it's red and it's got black spots. And the other pair that they've met then tell them about their snail and how it has a stripy shell. And Sadia, echoing Helen, manages to say ladybird spots and is praised by the nearby TA. Then the teacher looks at reading, writing and viewing suggestions. And again, she gets the importance of grouping and peer modelling. She gets the importance of matching writing and meaning. And also of making those connections with home so that learning can be reinforced and parents and carers can be included. And so, after the activity, the children sit in groups to record what they've learnt. Some of them are writing, some of them are drawing. At this point, Sadia's group's expanded um, from a pair to a four, and it includes Azra, who's another speaker of Urdu, um, Azra's partner, and Helen. So Sadia and Azra are able to swap a few words in Urdu while they draw their mini beasts, and Sadia copies the word for ladybirds under her carefully drawn picture, and she's very, very pleased with it. As a final activity, then the whole class plays a matching pairs game. This one is available from the Bell Foundation website under our resources. And this reinforces the vocabulary that they've learned. So Sadia finishes the day. She's had a very good day. She's made new friends. She's learned some mini beast words in English. She's very proud of her ladybird picture. She's been fully included in the class activities and she's gone home happy to talk to her parents about the activity looking forward to showing them the picture book and they'll talk about it together in the home language and this will help develop her bilingualism so that was the day for Sadia now I'd like to move to a slightly more challenging one maybe um, I'd like to introduce Ermel from Albania who's arrived late in secondary school he actually arrived part way through year nine um, assessed at band B and has now just entered year 10 working at the very beginning at band C he's generally thought that the teachers perceive him as being a bright boy but his proficiency in English which is currently at band C is holding him back from achieving in the fast moving UK key stage four curriculum Initially, he settled quite well in school, but recently he's becoming somewhat frustrated. And the reason for this is that he was a good student at his previous school and he feels as if he can't show his ability. And also, Ermal's wondering that the teachers and the peers in year 10 are constantly referencing GCSEs, GCSE, GCSE. And he's worked out what this is. It's some kind of exam, but he's unsure if it applies to him. At Bansi, he's starting to understand much more of what's going on around him. He's, he understands a lot of conversations that he hears, but he struggles to join in himself because conversations are inevitably fast moving and wide ranging. And this is also a source of frustration to him. The other thing about Ermal is he loves cars, the faster the better. He wants to be a mechanic, uh, preferably for Formula One. However, thermodynamics comes later in the curriculum and right now it's a biology module on cells. So the teacher, the science teacher, wants to prepare his students uh, for the longer five or six marks questions. He's looking ahead to those five and six mark questions that occur in science GCSE and require students, in fact, to write a short text at the same time as showcasing their scientific knowledge. So the teacher consults the subject specific guidance uh, available on the Bell Foundation website and also the strategies document. And he reads the guidance for band C reading, writing, viewing, finds the following suggestions. The importance of exploring and activating prior knowledge, because EAL learners are never blank slates, and particularly older learners at secondary level 
will almost always already be in possession of considerable subject content knowledge. And then also the science textbook, although it's a good one, it's dense, it's wordy, it's daunting to someone with limited English. So reducing the cognitive load can help avoid overwhelm by concentrating on the key concepts the teacher's thinking. And then finally, I expect most people have heard of the teaching learning cycle. Um, the idea is that you as the teacher build the field with key vocabulary structures and concepts and activating prior knowledge. And then you look at model text. Um, for example, in this case, the teacher might want to provide model answers to these questions that they're working towards and they analyze them. How many sentences? What kind of sentences? How many scientific points? How's the text answering the command word? Explain, describe, evaluate, etc. And they'd want to look at good answers uh, to similar questions and then to co-construct their own answers and then finally move to individual construction, which is what will be expected of them in the exam. So the teacher looks at those three things. Elmore was fully educated in Albania before coming to the UK to an age appropriate level. So the teacher knows that um, and is keen to find out what he might already know about the topic. Unfortunately, there's no Albanian speaking member of staff available. So he uses some picture prompts and a translation tool. And <clears throat> he ascertains that yes, Irma has indeed studied this topic before, but it's hard to tell um, because of translation problems, it's hard to tell in how much detail or how effectively, but at least the teacher knows that the concepts are not entirely new to Irma. And therefore translation tools are gonna to be helpful to help him transfer his knowledge from Albanian to English. So Ermal is given some pre-class work of labeling pictures of different cell types with the Albanian and English names. And he brings this um, in note form with him to the lesson. The teacher wants to skill Ermal up with the language and structures he needs to succeed in this module. So he reduces the cognitive load by using a substitution table like this one, enabling Ermal to jointly practice identifying cell types, from the pictures and their functions and also practicing using sentence structures. And activities like this can be done with the whole class, um, but in this case, it's something that's given to Ermal to help him while the rest of the class is answering questions from the textbook. The teacher builds the field then, vocabulary, examples, pictures, curriculum content, um, what the children already know, and they look at model texts. These are examined, um, for example, the six point exam question model answers. And they think about how are they constructed? How do they respond to the command words in the questions such as describe, explain, evaluate? How do you put a kernel of point scoring scientific knowledge into a coherent English sentence and then group the sentences together to make a cohesive text? That's what the teacher's exploring. So it's build the fields, model the text, co-construction and then finally individual construction is what they're moving towards. So the students have a go at co-constructing text together and um, this is done first with the teacher at the whiteboard and then in pairs or groups and this is revisited and then the students attempt to construct individual text. This is the whole class. Band C students such as Ermal might still benefit at this stage from some extra scaffolding but the scaffolding needs to be gradually reduced as the learner increases in confidence before the exam. So Irma might start the year uh, with substantial scaffolding, such as a, a close activity like this. But the teacher knows that he will progress to being able to work from some sentence stems and then to just some individual word prompts. And then finally, eventually, Irma will be able to use the question to make his own notes before answering the question effectively writing his own scaffold. The teacher looks at the guidance for supporting speaking and listening at Bansi and finds the following. The importance of allowing thinking time so that the learner can construct answers in English in their head. Anyone who's ever learned um, a foreign language knows how frustrating it is when you can follow a conversation but you can't join in because by the time you've conjugated the verbs and done whatever you need to do and made a sentence in your head, they've moved on and they're talking about something else. So the importance of allowing thinking time. Also moving from more closed or restricted questions to open questions. 
and then also creating opportunities for structured talk through, for example, um, stimulus like graphic organizers. The teacher thinks about his questioning techniques. When cold calling, he gives Irma a warning so that he can have time to marshal his thoughts in English um, and get an answer together, and he is expected to answer, so expectations are being kept high. He asks closed questions or restricted questions, giving a choice of answers, where Irma then only has to say words that are repeated from the question. He would have to answer that one with either nerve cell or hair root cell. But as his confidence builds, the teacher will start to ask more open questions like this. So, Irma worked for the group of friendly peers who are good role models of both language and attitude to learning to try and complete this graphic organizer. The groups are working in competition to see who can complete it correctly first. And Irma has much to contribute because he studied this subject before and he knows a lot of the answers. And for this activity, he's allowed to use his translation app, um, perhaps on his smartphone or perhaps on a tablet. And the group quickly realized that he has the subject knowledge and include him in their conversation. This gives him practice in meaningful subject specific dialogue within a non-threatening small group. So eventually the teacher is able to monitor the group, see how much has been retained and to watch Ermel along with his classmates, getting the opportunity to rehearse and practice speaking the key scientific vocabulary. Perhaps the teacher is able to make some notes towards Ermel's holistic assessment. And when, when the correct answers are revealed at the end, there are some cheers, some rubbing out, some rewriting, and one group wins, maybe Ermel's, maybe not. So Ermel finishes this lesson feeling a bit positive. He's feeling less frustrated. He's learned some important new scientific vocabulary in English. He's been able to prove some of what he already knows and get some recognition for that. He's been able to speak some English with his peers. And crucially, perhaps, those exams which everyone talks about all the time, those GCSEs, maybe they're not only for other people. Maybe he can achieve in them too. And his teacher is thinking the same thing. So finally, we hope that these ideas and suggestions will help um, teachers and educators to create these inclusive spaces in their classrooms and thus to enable learners using EAL to learn and thrive. Okay, so that's my presentation. At this point, I think I'm gonna hand back over to Catherine um, for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really very, very clear, really informative, lots and lots of information in there. Um, and I know mm. we had a few questions coming through um, as we're going, but I'll, I'll allow people a few minutes <laughs> to add some questions, but we'll start with some of the ones, um, we also received some questions via email, so I will um, just find those. Give me one second, where are we? Um, so one of the first questions, and it's actually probably one that I can answer, is around the old strategies um, and whether they can, people can still access the old strategies. Um, the answer is they won't be on the website, um, so they're not there anymore. They are, however, still within our assessment tracker, um, so they're still there. However, as Sarah mentioned earlier, we are going to be updating that, so we will be taking those out of our tracker, putting the, the new ones that Sarah's been talking about today into the tracker. If you do desperately want to get your hands on the old ones for any reason, um, then please just drop us an email um, at our info at, and I'll pop that in the um, in the chat in a moment, um, and we can we can share them with you. Um, but I think we're quite confident that the new ones are are better and more up to date, and all of the links work, and very you know all of the things Sarah's spoken about today. Um, so we'd strongly encourage you, or you know, point you towards those ones instead. Um, Second question, um, Sarah, probably one for you. Okay. How are these useful if I have learners from multiple bands in my class was one of the questions that I had. I yeah, know. I did touch on that, I think, in the presentation. I mean, we've divided them in many, many different ways, um, sort of chopped them up into lots of different ways. But um, I would refer you, 
if you've got many proficiency bands in one class, which lots of people will have, I'd refer you to the five key principles because they span all the bands. And so, for example, if you design activities which integrate language and subject content and collaborative activities which facilitate social inclusion, these, these will help all of your learners. So it's kind of a case of reading around the different bands that you have represented and coming up um, with something that works for you. Um, if you have a graphic organiser, for example, um, learners at lower bands would benefit from those if they have lots of visuals with them. Um, for those at higher bands, you might want to remove some of the visuals. That's just a quick example. Okay. Um, another question we've had is around um, the strategies and whether they are useful for isolated learners. So I think people are talking here about if maybe if you just have one learner who's, who uses EAL within your class rather than many, yeah, many, many EAL learners, what, what your thoughts might be on that? I would say they were perfectly useful for isolated learners and particularly those which promote social inclusion um, because the isolated learner will, will um, yeah, will be needing to make connections and make friends um, along with things like translation tools like Say Hi or Google if the learner is at a, a lower proficiency band and um, and is an isolated language in the school. Lovely. Um, we've got one about the tracker, but I think we've answered that already. Uh, one about intervention groups um, and whether they could be used with intervention groups. And I know you spoke about the, the fact that they were they have been designed to, to be used within the mainstream classroom, but but whether they could be used there too. Yeah. I mean, as I said, they're primarily intended for mainstream lessons because that's where we firmly believe learners using AAL should be, at least for most of the time. Um, because that's where the real learning of both English and curriculum content takes place. However, having said that, the, there's definitely a place for small group interventions and one-to-one. -one, and I think, yes, the strategies can be used um, alongside the curriculum content. So that they're, they're strategies meant that you're meant to interpret another curriculum through. Um, it's, yeah, it's not a set of lesson plans. It's a set of yeah ideas that you can interpret other curriculums through. But yeah, no reason why you couldn't use them with interventions. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a question around um, how would you how would you suggest using them for, for teachers who are time poor? And we are no lots of teachers are time poor, but um, super, super busy teachers, many things on their agendas. But yeah. How? Yeah. How would you suggest time poor teachers sort of engage with the strategies? Um, Prioritise the quick wins, maybe things like groupings, um, positioning in the class. Uh, use technology, use the links to direct resources on the website so you don't have to invent them. These are the TRGs on our website are intended for mainstream lessons. You don't need to make your own. And then finally, I'd say that, yeah, there is a bit of time involved in reading it. Can't do anything about that, but it's it's an investment of time that I think will actually save you time ultimately as your classes will become um, more manageable. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that, definitely. Um, so we've got a few more, Sarah, that have come in. Um, so a question from Lucia, and it's it not necessarily related to the strategies, but I think maybe you and I could probably ever go answering this one together. Um, but she's asked, is it always best to keep learners in groups based on their current language levels across the key stages or group them into year groups regardless of their level to focus on curriculum linked to the specific year group? Um, and she's given an example. So, for instance, if year 10 are starting their GCSE text in English literature, would it be best to keep all year 10 EAL students together for specific interventions to, to focus on those texts? Or, for example, group, you know, maybe year 10, year 13 students by language level. So I think I guess she's kind of thinking about sort of streaming according to language level. Um, whether you've got any thoughts on that? Is this for intervention groups? Does it sound like it's for intervention rather than mainstream? It does sound like it's for intervention rather than mainstream, yeah. Well, I don't know why you would be running intervention groups for learners who are at band C or above, really. I would have thought that most intervention groups would be for students at bands A and B. And therefore, yes, I would I would group them um, chronologically. I would group them according to the curriculum that they're missing. So therefore, you can um, help them with that. That that would be my answer. 
I, I would you think? I would 100% agree. I would say grouping them according to what they, you know, the demands of the curriculum so that you're able to kind of whatever you're doing in those intervention groups is kind of, it, it, yeah, is going to support what, whatever is, you know, the primary purpose of, of, of being in the classroom. And I think you can kind of, do, you know, if you have got A's and B and potentially C learners within that, within that group, I think then thinking about adaptive teaching strategies to kind mm -hmm. of manage how you within, would, within the group. Within you could that. also run some, um, it, it, well, I mean, every context is different, but if it were possible in your context, you could run some after school extra tuition sessions for uh, your, your band C or D um, if you yeah. wanted to. But I personally feel that they should be in the class. And I, I would I would tend to agree as well. Um, and this actually is it links to some work that the foundation are thinking about doing um, over the next six months or so um, around kind of how to kind of manage intervention classes and sort of how to sort of yeah what what how how you might go about organising that kind of provision. Um, so keep keep your eyes out for future work from us on that because something we know is is is. Uh, yeah people are very interested in um in learning more about um i've got a question here from diana and she said do you suggest grouping eal learners together um or with first language english learners um i don't know about you i would say it depends what you're doing really <laughs> yeah i guess it does depend what you're doing or and another answer would be both yeah a, a mixture a mixture of both yeah, yeah. Simple yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there are definitely opportunities in the classroom where, particularly if you've got learners who share a first language, um, you know, sort of using that together. But then equally, if you're wanting to provide good models of, 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 of English, yeah, really cool. very much depends on what you've got what going on in your classroom. But yeah, I think kind of grouping based upon, you know, the, what, you, what you're doing that particular day. Um, mm -hmm couple of questions around if a pupil is unable to read or write in their primary language and is therefore unable to or has difficulty in accessing the curriculum um, are there any specific strategies within what we offer that would be good for those learners I, I know this is can be a real challenge particularly for mm. those late in in the curriculum in secondary um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts around that Sarah I think, I think with learners, older learners who um, who struggle with reading and writing, perhaps also in their first language, the, there is a place for some intervention to teach, um, to teach our script basically if they don't know it. Um, yeah, there's a place for that. Also, um, such learners can end up feeling isolated. So I would work a lot on speaking and listening activities that will enable them to develop their spoken English and um, their understanding of English, um, accepting that this will develop faster um, than their literacy in English. Yeah. I think definitely think trying where you can to think about specific interventions as well that you've got for got for those learners, um, you know, and and targeting kind of where, as, as Sarah said, you know, making sure that there is some inclusion into into the mainstream and thinking about where would be good to kind of support those learners with with developing those literacy skills. Um, I realise resources <laughs> um can be a, a huge issue and a bit of a barrier there for for some schools um i'm gonna have to i think kind of bring it bring it to a close there i'm afraid i know we've got so many questions and i'm, I'm afraid i'm not going to have chance to to answer them all today um but thank you so much, Sarah, for for, for such a, a, a great presentation. And I'm, I'm I really hope people are uh, appreciate the the sort of strategies and find them useful and are able to kind of actively use them. Um, just a couple of things to before we go. Um, we're going to be running a repeat um, of today's webinar because we were absolutely inundated with people wanting to join. So we're going to be running a second one. So if you have colleagues or people within your networks that missed today, then please do share our webinar, which will be a repeat, uh, which is on Wednesday, the 4th of October um, at four o'clock. Um, 
anyone that you think might be interested in, please promote it to them. Um, I'd also like to flag that we, we're going to be doing, uh, so we are doing some research with refugee education, examining what's happening up and down the UK with regards to provision for late arrivals. So lots of people actually have been asking about that today. It's really mm. tricky. It's something we want to learn more about. So we're working with our UK to learn more about what provision is out there, either in alternative provision or within schools or, you know, how people are supporting um, late arrivals. Um, so thinking about those learners coming in from kind of age 13. Um, so we've got a bit of a survey out there or our UK have got a survey out there to, to try and learn a little bit more about this. So if you know anybody who is has experience supporting um, these groups, then please um, go and check that survey out. I've just put the link in the chat now. I'd be really, really grateful um, if you could share that with anyone you think would uh, be able to, to contribute. And um, that would be fantastic. Um, Sarah, did you want to flag great ideas? <laughs> um just that it's worth having a look at them because they work very well alongside the um, the strategies and many of them are referenced in the strategies. And also we've got some courses coming up. So if you want to talk about those, Catherine. I can do. Um, and I also have just put the link to our courses in the chat as well. Um, so we've got a number of different courses coming up. We've got, I think, maybe one or two places left on our teaching assistance course, which is starting on the 31st of October. We're running leading a whole school strategy in January. That one is always very, very popular. Um, so please go and check that out. Um, and then we've got various other assessment courses coming up. So please, you know, do do go check them out. Um, we're, we, yeah, we're, we're really proud of what we do with our online courses. Um, so, yeah, if you think they would be useful, please share them. And I think we will bring it to a close there. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining um, and taking part in the webinar today. You will receive the, um, the recording um of uh, of the webinar you'll get that as a link um and we really hope to see you next time and thanks so much sarah you did a fab job okay thank you <laughs> all right take care